So I tried to put some thoughts together on the plane over to uh, reflect on where I thought we might be as a country with regards to technology. And I was asked to talk about technology or innovation for good. So it's in, those, in, that, in that context that my, um, my, my talk is kind of focused. Uh, it was just a few days ago that for the first time I watched a video of a man demonstrating a machine that was unlike any machine that had ever come before it. This mic seems to be cutting in and out, is it? <laughs> Useless. Is there any other mics? Just project. Project? I'm worried about these guys. Are they okay? No? <laughs> you can huddle, yeah. Um, the video I was watching was of an invention that had the potential or has the potential at the time to impact generations for centuries or even possibly millennia. When I look at it, I would rank it right up there amongst the finest and most impactful innovations of uh, history. If you can imagine, there are two uh, metal plates in this video peppered with an array of symbols and indents, and an older man lays them flat. He picks up what looks like two dumbbells, except only one bell on each dumbbell, and except the dumbbells are like big cushions. He takes the two dumbbells and starts pounding them into black, shiny puddles. He then takes those dumbbells and starts pounding them on top of the two metal plates that he's put together. Above the plates, there's a little frame where he slots a piece of paper in like a window pane and punches two pins in. He slides the frame down, pushes it across the table, and then turns a key like a safe to apply pressure onto the paper. He pulls it out flips up the window, picks up the paper, and there are two pages of printed text side by side. This is the Gutenberg press invented. That is a good idea. All, in, all event organizers should know that everyone should be mic'd up with two mics. Because although it's 2018, I don't think I've ever been to an event where the mic hasn't, at least for one moment, not worked. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, I watched this video last week, and this is the Gutenberg Press invented in 1446. And along with it, the technology that we now call the book. Last year, one of our city councillors, Efeso Collins, took me around South Auckland to visit interesting projects and people. One morning, I dropped in to see Ian Toki, who's the general manager of the Otara Library, which is obviously filled with descendants of Gutenberg's press. We spoke about the role that the library has in the community and what events and activities they hold, and I asked him, when is the library busiest? His response was, between 3.30 and 5.30. Now, why do you think that was? Is it A, because there are after-school programs, tutoring and music to keep the kids interested? B, because sanitarium and foodstuffs had donated food to encourage the community to engage with the library? Or C, because Microsoft had partnered with them to donate a bank of computers and tablets that had an amazing, amazing array of apps and games for the kids and parents to engage with? The answer is D, because the kids do not have the internet at home and they need to do their homework and the only place they can get online after school is the library. Some of them come using cheap Android phones where they try to do their homework and their essays and their Google searches on their tiny screens. And many of the homes they go back to at night have only a couple of books. Should I just ditch the mic? Yeah. <laughs> because it's ridiculous. <laughs> You think? You think? All right. One more time. 
<laughs> I don't think this even works. Does it? I think you don't need yeah. it. I think we don't need it. I think we're going to have to give up on the, uh, the video, guys. Um, so, in these kids' homes, they're barely connected to the present, let alone the future. If you come to my house, you'll see a five-year-old, privileged, fortunate, digitally roaming every day, creatively, and in his own way, learning far more about the real and imaginary world than I ever could have dreamt of by, by an age far older than he is now. He watches a video to, on how to take apart and fix a vacuum cleaner. He, get, he goes into one explaining the volcanoes to understand what's happening in Hawaii. He thinks the Hyperloop already exists and is excited for me to take him on it. He dives daily into his apps for fun and interest, interesting and exciting games with numbers, words, logic, shapes, puzzles that stretch his mind and fire up his curiosity. He listens to audiobooks. Some pair with pages, so he follows the words, even though he can't read most of them. He asks to learn how to code, because he's heard kids on YouTube talk about it. So we pull up a website recommended by his school, CodeMonkey, and within half an hour, a monkey is moving around a screen over bridges and fields collecting bananas. And within all of this, his brain is fed thousands of words a day, all within the four walls of a home, also filled with books, dozens of which are his. A 20-year global study recently concluded that children who grow up in homes with at least 20 books will stay in school significantly longer. That same study identified the effective impact of a child growing up in a house with a few hundred books was the equivalent of an extra three to six years education compared to children who did not. Every single study in history has shown that the more words and language a child is exposed to in the earliest years, is directly linked to their likelihood to stay in and succeed at school. Corporate prison planners in the US forecast their future cell capacity requirements by tracking the reading level of eight-year-olds around the country. Because there is a direct correlation between the reading capacity of an eight-year-old and future prison populations in the area. Almost all studies in the world have a positive correlation between kids staying in school completing school to their likelihood to stay out of jail, out of drugs, and into contributing to a healthy, happy society with a solid job. So after 500 years, the mere presence of this flat, one-dimensional, one-way, uh, static technology of books still statistically determines your chances and choices in life. And if we believe, as I do, and I have witnessed, that the internet and a tablet accelerates the learning and discovery of a young child orders of magnitude beyond what a simple book can. We have on one hand a child growing up in a home preparing for the space age while the other is left behind in the bronze. This government has said 150,000 children do not have internet access in their homes. Even if it was a third of that, it's far too many and will hold this country back from any hopes of being a leading digital nation in the country in the coming generation. Because far too many of our children will have been handicapped before the starting blocks without a choice or a chance of catching up. So while we are still closing the gap on a 500-year-old technology that we know has a major impact on a child and community's future, ever the optimist that I am, I still can't help but see a gulf the size of the Pacific Ocean being allowed to open up before our eyes. And I can't help but believe that addressing this issue is perhaps the most important challenge facing us if we want to innovate for good, as Tech Week wants to this week, for all and not just for some. Now, as these kids get older and they become teenagers and eventually adults like you and I, we face new challenges. There's a famous experiment featuring a dog and a bell. Pavlov's dog came to know that every time the bell rang, there was food and his mouth would water. After a while, just the sound of the bell on its own would produce the identical physiological effect. Today's bell, I think, is like the heart, the comment, 
the little red circle that shows how many messages you have read or haven't read. Today's bell is pulling down the screen of our mobile devices in hope of a reward, which several of the key architects of Facebook last year have expressed their deep guilt and disgust and liken as no different to a slot machine. If those are the bells, then who are the dogs? We are walking around like Pavlov's dog with pocket slot machines for the mind that some of us pull on a hundred times a day and Gen Y have been measured to pull on up to 150 to 200 times. So we have created these vehicles and instruments of joy, collaboration and progress through modern devices and connectivity which when we turn on ourselves, can undermine who we are and chip away at our humanity. They can take us away from the real world, poke at our self-esteem, create imaginary anxieties in our minds based on other people's views on our digital breadcrumbs. And they steadily lure us into bubbles that filter out the thoughts of people who don't think like us and people who don't like the same things as us and don't follow the same ideas as us. We are seeing a culture of Gen Zs so obsessed with how their lives appear on Instagram or Snapchat versus how they actually are in reality. We are seeing sleep troubles, posture problems, and spine issues in kids as young as seven from hunching over blue screens. We are losing our ability to be alone with ourselves. We simply cannot wait for a bus, a coffee, or a friend without checking our phones. We have never before been more connected in history, but many of us have never felt more alone. Youth, youth suicide, depression, mental health, and loneliness, these issues are surely not caused by technology, but with the anxieties and expectations of digital connectedness as it is today, I can't help but think technology is hurting more than it's helping. We need to turn these technologies back on themselves and design a myriad of ways for them to be a part of the solution rather than just part of the problem. There's a welcome boom in the US and Europe of digital services, therapy, and tools for mental health that we need here. And in New Zealand, we have a chance and a choice to use these tools of today and of tomorrow for good. So what then exactly does tomorrow hold? People say, and I read and I hear, 20 years ago, who would have known the mobile would become a pocket supercomputer? People say, who would have known Amazon would have become Amazon? People say, who would have known there would be a Facebook that connects 2 billion people? Of course we knew. Many people knew. GeoCities was formed in 1994. Bezos went public with Amazon in 1995. I started the Hyperfactory in 2001. But knowing is not enough. Only those who have the courage to act on what they know create the future. And I can tell you who also could have known. The people who were listening. The people who stopped for a moment. And the people who took the time to imagine what may come. People I hope, like some of you in this room, you can spend a week at somewhere like Singularity University in California like I did a few years ago and pretty much come out aware of almost, almost everything that is likely to happen the next decade, 30 or 50 years or beyond. It's not the knowing that is the problem. It's the doing, it's the shaping and the choosing. Back in 2001, the Clark government convened and established with urgency something they called the knowledge wave. Some of you may remember that. There was a real sense of knowing back then that the internet was gonna transform the world and our lives and we had this golden opportunity to spearhead a knowledge economy. But the knowledge wave ended up being just exactly that. Our country stood with a collectively dumb look on our face with full and complete knowledge that the world was on the verge of an entire transformation and we stood there and we waved at it. 10 years later, the Herald column, as Fran O'Sullivan noted, 
the knowledge wave stands out as one of the key missed opportunities that litter New Zealand's history. Are we willing to let ourselves be written about like that again in 2028? Because here we find ourselves again, almost 20 years later, at the cusp of totally new worlds. And yes, in those last 20 years, yes, we have come far, in despite of the knowledge wave, not because of it. And with little thanks to any leadership from those concentric corridors of Wellington, who are supposed to light and pave the way, We've only really come this far because of the vision, tenacity, and aspiration of ordinary New Zealanders across the country like yourselves who said, screw it, if these guys don't get it, let's just get on with it and build our own digital nation with our own hands and our own minds. And after 20 years of successive governments who have barely even paid lip service to embracing, enabling, and aspiring to be a digitally-led nation and a digitally-led economy and a digitally-led society, then last year it appears Perhaps that all has changed because both of our major political parties had committed to creating the country's first position of a chief technology officer. Whatever you think of the scope and power of that role, the mere acknowledgement that such a role is needed seems to me a signal that maybe with the backing of our nation and the highest officers of the Prime Minister, maybe we have another chance and another choice to create a collective future that looks unlike anything from our past. It seems to me that at this time, on the cusp of new revolutions that will far outstrip what we have seen thus far, and at a time when New Zealand itself has never before been looked upon in a more positive light by people throughout the world as a beacon of hope and humanity, it seems to me that at this time that the challenge of innovation for good for our nation should have us forging ahead to create meaningful work and daily livelihoods of ordinary citizens in the face of inevitable automation and, in the end, artificial intelligence. Just as it should have us forging ahead towards a fully renewable transportation fleet with a purpose and a plan, just as it should have us forging ahead with more capital, resources and ideas for many more bold new companies that shape the future, seeking to benefit people, planet and profit, just as it should have us forging ahead pioneering protein, meat and milk grown far from the paddocks of a traditional farm, and just as that challenge of innovation for good should have us answering how we become better parents, brothers, friends, neighbors and citizens, face to face, not just Facebook to Facebook. 250 years ago on the other side of the world, a tiny country for 100 years became a sustained hotbed of genius. It charted groundbreaking advances in ideas of science, philosophy, engineering, technology, economics, and medicine, leading Voltaire, the French philosopher of the day, to state, it is to Scotland that we must look for our idea of civilization. And what became known as the Scottish Enlightenment began. It seems to me that if this government is serious as they say they are, and we all are serious, which I know we are, that together we have a chance and a choice to invite the visionaries of our generation from China to Chile to join arms with New Zealand in a bold adventure to create a model country of the future, which because of our size and our sensibility, we all know we can and should be. Fully sustainable, fully prosperous, fully inclusive, conscious and kind. It seems to me at least that there is a very real possibility of a New Zealand enlightenment ahead, where we can bend the world in our direction if we choose to allow our humanity and not just technology to guide us. Thank you.